Welcome to the BIOS podcast by Elix Ventures. BIOS is a community of early stage healthcare and life sciences founders and investors. BIOS curates content, hosts events, crafts resources, and creates a community to facilitate collaboration. BIOS unites like-minded members of the startup universe and is anchored by Alix Ventures, a San Francisco-based venture fund that invests in early stage healthcare and life sciences companies. To learn more about us, visit bios.community or alix.bc. Thanks for tuning in BIOS community, sharing a quick shout out from Amazon Web Services. The AWS Startups team provides dedicated resources, expertise, and credits to help healthcare and life sciences startups grow and excel. We help startups build for scale, overcome technical and regulatory challenges, and accelerate time to market by opening doors and creating business opportunities. To learn more about these resources, including how to access $25,000 in AWS credits through our partnership with BIOS, please contact us at bios.community backslash AWS. We're thrilled to welcome Jacob Vogelstein, co-founder and managing partner at Catalio Capital Management to the show today. Thank you once again for joining us. To help host this episode, I'm joined with my colleague, Chris Godbon. Let's kick things off, Jacob. Can you share a brief intro with us? Yeah, thanks for having me. So I am Jacob Vogelstein. I am the co-founder and managing partner, as you said, of Catalio Capital Management, which I started just about 18 months ago with my partner, George Petrokoulos. My background prior to starting Catalio uh, was initially in academia, did my PhD in biomedical engineering at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. I was a professor for a number of years at Hopkins before uh, starting investing through a combination of a hedge fund that I accidentally co-founded when I wrote some algorithms that seemed like they were useful for trading futures contracts and predicting prices of commodities. And then later out of a family office where we were making a number of angel investments and eventually decided that I was having more fun investing than I was running my lab and uh, decided to make the switch over to finance full time. I've been uh, an investor full time since 2016. George and I got together at, at Camden Partners in Baltimore to launch our first uh, seed stage fund um, out of Camden. We worked in that group for a few years before deciding to go it alone in Catalio and starting our own business. And it's been a crazy uphill, a very exciting ride since then. Thanks for the background, Jacob, and great context for today's episode. I think one of the more rare stories we've actually had on BIOS thus far, as you mentioned, you began your career on the faculty at Hopkins and served as program manager at the Intelligence Innovation Research Projects Activity. You also received the Presidential Early Career Award in Science and Engineering in 2017. That's amazing achievements here. And I think a radical kind of maybe career path for an academic to realize they want to be a VC. Not too many have made the switch. Can you talk about when you wanted to make the pivot from research to investing? Yeah, so I've always been entrepreneurial at heart. I've always personally found it very exciting and um, motivating to try to build something new, create something that didn't exist before. And when I was growing up, I was in a family that was had placed a very high premium on delivering value back to society. My father, Bert Vogelstein, is very prominent oncology researcher at Hopkins. He, through my upbringing, made it clear to me and to my brother and sister that, you know, it was very rewarding to be able to develop your life to something other than yourself and uh, be able to contribute back to the world. And that was very influential on my uh, thinking of career paths because certainly, you know, as an entrepreneur, I had plenty of ideas for things that I wanted to do in businesses that I wanted to build, but I had a very strong pull towards academia, trying to make sure that I was contributing value back to society and not just to myself. So it was a little bit of an internal struggle, to be honest with you, for a long time. I would have a, a, a side gig almost at every point in my professional career of doing something either, you know, from an investing perspective, from an entrepreneurial perspective. I started up a, uh, a, a small SMS backend processing company with my best friend from high school that ended up turning into a multi-million dollar business that he actually ended up selling to a very prominent uh, now public company. I started this hedge fund, as I mentioned, almost as an accident. 
I was working on some algorithms in my graduate career, and my brother, who's a, a neuroscientist as well by training, was working on some related technologies. And we got approached by a family friend and said, do we know anything about investing in futures? And we said, absolutely not. But we have these cool algorithms and they work for predicting, you know, the activity of the brain. So maybe they'll work for predicting the uh, prices of uh, commodities and other instruments on the futures exchange. And so we sort of fell into writing these algorithms that became part of the, 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 the core trading platform for this hedge fund. Did that for a while. And then, as I said, uh, kind of was always someone who enjoyed having that entrepreneurial bent. IARPA, the organization that you mentioned, the Intelligence uh, Advanced Research Project Activity, was pretty much the closest thing you get to in academia to entrepreneurship. It's an opportunity to think big thoughts, identify a strategic direction for an area of science or technology, and try to deliver real products, you know, or real capabilities back to the government or back to uh, the world in, in those areas. And so, you know, I had a great time doing effectively the government version of company creation within IARPA. And that's really what led me to believe that A, that was really what I was passionate about doing and B, I needed to find a better outlet than doing it in my spare time. And so I had the opportunity of going out of IARPA to join this group, Camden Partners in Baltimore, where George, who I had known five years prior, he was actually my intern at my hedge fund back in the day, had already landed. He was really interested in building a life science venture fund focused on company creation, and it just seemed like a perfect fit. So that's kind of how I uh, evolved from being a scientist that wanted to be a, you know, an entrepreneur and was kind of doing it by night on, on the weekends to one who was doing it you know, nights and weekends and then also all day, every day. And Jacob, having made the leap yourself, what are your thoughts on what some might consider the latent entrepreneurial talent in academia? Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of, I mean, I think there's a, an enormous reservoir of, of entrepreneurial talent in academia. It's to, the trivial version of that is that almost every company, you know, that we invest in is... Uh, staffed up by and, you know, in many cases led by people that came out of academia and one at one time or another, just because so much of the life sciences businesses are, you know, technically focused and it requires a large amount of expertise, you know, to, to operate uh, those businesses at any level. But I think, you know, there's definitely a different culture in entrepreneurship and it is definitely like a know it when you see it kind of thing in terms of the caliber and the, the, the type of people that are likely to be more successful in entrepreneurship than academia. I think some of that is just unfortunate, you know, artifacts of historical investment patterns. You know, I think the industry, like many industries in our country, has evolved over time from a predominantly, you know, male patriarchal kind of almost perspective. And so a lot of the kind of aggressive, you know, very fast moving, almost macho tendencies that people tend to like in their CEOs, I think are carried over from those days. So there's definitely an archetype that is, is definitely still probably an unfortunate artifact, but, but, you know, within academia, there's a lot of people that you identify that meet that archetype. And I think, you know, we have been very intentional at Catalio about trying to think beyond, you know, the, the kind of conventional wisdom of who makes a good leader, who makes a good executive, who makes a good entrepreneur. I think, you know, even from the beginning, the first days of our investments, we've tried to maintain parity across gender and ethnic diversity in our portfolio companies, in our executive teams, in our board structures. But, but yeah, you know, to answer your question, uh, there's an enormous amount of talent out there. Some of it fits into the conventional mold and some of it's a little bit unconventional, but I think people that are interested in identifying that talent and making good use of it can certainly uh, find it in all shapes and forms in academia. One fun question we love to ask our guests to kick off episodes here comes from Dennis Gabor, electrical engineer and recipient of the 1971 Nobel Prize in Physics. He says the future cannot be predicted, but the future can be invented. Can you share with us what does inventing the future mean to you, Catalio? <laughs> I like that quote. Um, you know, it's it's funny, I, I think a, a large part of what we do at Catalio depends 
on a, a maybe an offshoot of that, which is not that the, the future can be predicted, but that there's certain people that have a prior probability of being right than others in predicting the future. So I might answer that question a little bit differently. You know, when we formed Catalio, uh, a large part of our, our focus is we wanted to do life science investing, you know, what we considered to be the right way. And what, what I mean by that is we wanted to make sure that we aligned the best outcomes in the market with the best outcomes in the clinic. We wanted our companies that we were to, to invest in to, to deliver value all throughout the chain of stakeholders from investors to patients, to the scientists and the students who you know, were toiling away in the lab, creating the innovations that powered these companies. And a lot of what we were seeing in the market at the time when, when we were initiating our work at Calio and even in Camden prior, was that there was a, a disconnect in many cases. You know, the companies that were receiving the, the highest share price, you know, the best exits, were not always the ones that were delivering the most value to all stakeholders. In many cases, they were delivering a lot of value to investors and not much value back to the world, maybe never realizing any meaningful innovations in patient care or in you know, therapeutic domain. And we wanted to change that. You know, we thought that the reason for this disconnect and the reason for some of this inefficiency at some level in the market is that in many cases, the scientists who have really spent their entire lives devoted to building and creating the best and most innovative scientific and clinical solutions are not always so motivated to get engaged in the business aspect of commercialization of a life science technology. And unfortunately, without that focus, a lot of good science sits on the shelf at universities or it's developed in ways that are suboptimal in companies that aren't, you know, that, that, are, that are not led or steered appropriately or in the best way. And we thought we could make a difference in that. And this gets back to your question because we thought that if we look at what's successful in, in life sciences investing and we look at the different aspects of what makes a, com a, a company and a business successful, you know, you start with great leadership, great management teams. You have to do be in the right markets. You have to have your timing right. You have to have the right financial syndicates and partners. And you have to have good science. But all other things being equal, the better the science, probably the higher probability of success. Because all other things being equal with the same management teams, the same financial syndicates, the same markets, better science should lead to higher probability of success in the lab higher probability of success in the clinic, and ultimately higher probability of success in the market. All other things being equal, the better technology should win the day more often. And so, you know, getting back to your question of, you know, you can't necessarily predict the future, uh, you have to invent the future. I think a, one of the things that, that we took to heart at Catalio is that although we may be sitting in our, in our offices in New York or down in Baltimore and DC or you know, we're in London and, and all the various uh, outposts of Catalio, maybe we don't know exactly which technological solution is the right technological solution, but there are people who have seen you know, every permutation and every variation of a particular small molecule, of a particular you know, receptor, of a particular therapeutic strategy and approach. And if we are bringing those people into the fold at Catalio, then they better than most can predict or are more likely to be correct about predicting which science is going to win. And so, you know, I'll tell you a little bit more about the formulation and the structure of Catalio a little bit later. But to answer your question, a large part of what we do is partner with the scientists who have been at the forefront of these technological you know, areas of you know, the sort of leading and cutting edge of life sciences and ask them which science do they, in which science do they have the most underlying conviction? You know, where are the strongest scientific and clinical value propositions in their areas of expertise? and try to make investments in companies that are promoting those technologies as opposed to others. Because again, all other things being equal, if we can find the right management teams, find the right financial syndicates and find the right markets, betting on the right science, we think is more likely to deliver good outcomes than any other thing that we can do. I think that's an amazing intro here. I'll pass it off to Chris now to talk about Catalio and scaling a venture firm. Thank you, Chaz and Jacob. Catalio is a multi-strategy life science investment firm 
that has grown exponentially since its launch last year. For those not familiar, Jacob, can you share an overview on Catalio and walk us through its founding? Yeah, for sure. So as I mentioned, we started Catalio in just uh, July 1st of 2020. So we're now about 16 months in, 16 months and 11 days. And we launched Catalio as a spin out essentially of Camden Partners, which is a multi-billion dollar private equity group in Baltimore that was itself a spin out of T. Rowe Price about 25 years prior. George and I, for the few years preceding the launch of Catalio, had run a very early stage life science investment uh, strategy focusing on seed stage companies in Baltimore, largely in an economic development effort to promote uh, businesses out of the Hopkins ecosystem. And although the fund that we ran at Camden was very small, $15 million uh, in, in, in total, it gave us a lot of the seeds that we needed to plant to identify the blossoms that would turn into Catalio. One of the great things we did at Camden was partner with a lot of scientists at Hopkins and a lot of clinicians at Hopkins that had really innovative technology. Hopkins is one of the you know, technology leaders in the world and many different areas of life sciences. And we had kind of a pole position or sort of front row seats into that innovation and had the opportunity to try to commercialize a lot of technologies out of those labs. While we successfully were able to identify a bunch of really exciting technologies, we also found that starting companies in a vacuum, you know, absent the ecosystem of innovation and entrepreneurship is enormously challenging. You know, Baltimore is a wonderful area. Hopkins is a great school, but it's not the same as starting a, a company in Cambridge where there's, you know, 50 companies doing something similar down the street and, you know, hundreds or thousands of people who want to apply to each job posting, you know, who are eligible to fill each job that you post, I should say. Nor is there a, a set of experienced leadership or management teams ready to lead the next big thing in, in the area. Very different than, you know, a place like Cambridge, different than a place like San Francisco, different than a place like New York. And so while we found in our Camden strategy that we had great access to technology, we found that we didn't have great access to the right people and we didn't have access to the right networks that we needed to appropriately capitalize and grow the business. So in forming Catalio, we wanted to ensure that we solved all legs of that we found a solution for all um, aspects of this problem. Not just that we were able to identify the right technology, but that we were also able to identify the right people and the right financial syndicates. And so Catalia was really launched as a collaboration between, on the one hand, me and George, and on the other hand, the world's leading serial scientist entrepreneurs. And then on uh, a third hand, if you'll uh, allow me some, some license on my analogies here, some of the world's leading investors. So uh, starting with the scientists, when George and I created the firm, we went around the country and asked in aggregate 35 or so of what we considered to be the world's leading serial scientist entrepreneurs from academic institutions around the country to come join us as our partners at Catalio. We have folks from academic institutions all up and down the East and West Coast and everywhere in between, Hopkins, Harvard, MIT, Stanford, UCSF, UCSD, Rockefeller, NYU, Columbia, Duke, Berkeley, Caltech, and so forth and so on. We have folks from these institutions who are not only widely recognized as the world's leading experts in their respective fields, folks like Francis Arnold, who's a Nobel laureate at Caltech, Tom Sudhoff, a Nobel laureate at Stanford, or Greg Semenza. Uh, no, another Nobel Prize winner at, at Hopkins. We have folks like Jim Collins at Harvard MIT in, in synthetic biology, George Church, one of the founders of genetics, Phil Greenberg. We have people up and down, as I said, all over the, the country who have not only been recognized for their scientific prowess, but who also have each successfully started up and spun out a handful of companies on the basis of their work in their respective lab centers and institutes. And we asked these people to join us as our partners in Catalio. We gave 25% of the firm to these individuals with the idea that they would be able to point us to the ideas in the companies, whether in their labs or their colleagues' labs, with the greatest scientific innovations and the, and the greatest promise for delivering a category-defining business over the next you know, five, 10 years. So on the one hand, it was a collaboration with scientists 
And on the other hand, it was a collaboration with investors. In addition to me and George, we brought in to Catalio Capital Management, our management company, a group of the, some of the world's most successful investors, their ideas, their capital, and their names to Catalio to help us grow the world's leading multi-strategy life science investment firm. We thought that by bringing these two groups of people together, we could catalyze the kind of interactions that we needed to, to ensure that the world's leading science was promoted and, and developed and supported by the world's leading investors in a way that would lead to great outcomes, again, not just on the market, but also in the clinic. And that's really the, the rationale for Catalio, the way that it's been constructed um, and the way that we've been operating it as a partnership over the past you know, 18 months and plan to do for the next decade and beyond. Jumping off that, as a co-founder of Catalio, when did you decide to launch as a multi-strategy multi investment firm, as opposed to taking a more targeted investment approach? That's a good question. So from the beginning, we decided that we wanted to be full life cycle investors. You know, our focus as a firm is on best in class science, and you can only be dogmatic about so many things. You know, you can only say that your criteria are going to be very strict on a small number of of categories because otherwise you narrow the circle so much that there's not a whole lot to do. So we didn't want to say that we wanted to be super specific about picking only best in class science and it's got to be a certain round and we have to have a certain allocation target and it has to be a certain you know dollar value. It just seemed like we should focus on the things that we really care about and be flexible on the things that we don't. Uh, and so we decided the thing that we really cared about was being in companies with best in class science. And the things that we didn't care so much about was whether we were part of the initial founding investors in the seed or company formation stage, whether we invested in series A, B, C, or crossover rounds, you know, whether we are a 5% owner or 7% owner or a 20% owner, and really just want to make sure that we're aligned with companies that share our mission and vision. Thinking about ourselves as a full life cycle investor then, um, we wanted to make sure that if we started investing in a company on the private side, maybe as early as, you know, first money in to create a new co, we were able to support that company in all stages of its private, you know, life throughout all stages of private uh, funding. And then also we didn't have to hand it off to others as it matures into a public company. And so at the very least, we figured we needed both a public strategy and a private strategy so that we could support our companies throughout their life cycle. The credit strategy was actually a, an emergent feature that really came to us because of requests from existing portfolio companies. From the years that we had been investing prior to the formation of Catalio and in the early days of Catalio, we would often see companies that we would invest in that would do a full equity round and would then go out and do a, a debt round to put in some additional debt financing at a cheaper cost of capital from places like Silicon Valley Bank or PacWest or other organizations. Those organizations do a great job, but we thought that we already know a lot about these companies. We already understand a lot of the risks and we could perhaps underwrite debt differently, more attractively than some of the larger financial institutions that maybe have less expertise or less domain knowledge about the individual companies uh, in our portfolio. And so, Upon request, as our portfolio companies came to us to ask if we had any solutions or ideas for them for where to obtain debt financing, we stood up a debt strategy so that we could provide that solution and again, focus on things we care about, which is financing companies that we think can become category defining businesses in the life sciences and not worry so much about where we are in the capital stack you know, what kind of security it is, you know, whether it's senior secured debt or preferred stock, all of those things are ways to make money. But more importantly, they're also all ways to invest and support the businesses that we care about. So that's why we became multi-strategy. We thought that in order to meet our mission and vision for how we wanted to operate the business, we really needed flexibility in deploying capital across multiple different approaches and multiple different vehicles. And I'm sure your startups really appreciate that breadth of support. And it's clear you've put an incredible amount of thought into how you build Catalia. And the firm has grown so quickly that I feel lucky to be able to ask the question on everyone's mind. Was this your intention from the beginning? 
how do you blitz scale a venture firm? <laughs> yeah, definitely was our intention from the beginning. We had, as I said, we had a lot of good advisors, folks who had built multi-billion dollar internationally recognized investment groups that, you know, came into Catalio's capital management to help advise us on you know, what they did well, things that they did less well, pitfalls and mistakes um, to, to try not to, to make. And, you know, uh, one of the, the, the main messages from everyone who had achieved that sort of level of success was that you need capital to be able to invest in breakthrough biomedical technology companies. You know, we can talk about the kind of companies that we want to support all day, every day. But ultimately, unless we have money to invest, it's just going to be talk. And so, you know, George and I uh, set out very intentionally to build a network of investors that believed in the mission that we were setting out to achieve and that would pay uh, dividends through essentially positive reinforcement, you know, through people who were already well respected in the industry, who could tell their friends and their family that they were part of Catalio and that they believed in what we were doing and that you know the, these friends and family should also. And that network effect has been you know, very effective in growing the business uh, to the level that it's become today very quickly. It's not from, you know, it's not from one or two or three major backers or you know, seed investors that put in you know, nine digit checks. It's honestly from a very large number of very savvy investors, family offices, high net worth individuals who put, you know, a few million dollars to work at a time and have, have voted with their, you know, with their checkbook and have told their friends to do the same. And so we've been enormously grateful to the support we've received from our investors and really appreciative that they've gone out to do the advertising that we couldn't possibly do on our own to say to their networks that they believe in us and you know that that we should have an audience with their friends and their family and their their colleagues in their industries so that's honestly what what's been happening it's a lot of boots on the ground you know meetings face to face zoom to zoom dinners lunches and all those things it, as a constant background activity to meeting new companies and making investments and sitting in board meetings and doing all the things we do once we invest it's definitely it's definitely been a whirlwind period but it's been enormously rewarding because i think we are now in a position where we have the capital that we need to finance these businesses and allow them to take the steps they need to take to become really, uh, you know, game-changing businesses and life-saving therapies and, you know, and medical devices and, and whatnot. Taking that whirlwind a step further, what do you see as the next steps for, for Catalio? What is your vision for the firm? Yeah, so I think... We started Catalio with the idea that we want to do a combination of company creation and, you know, support companies at whatever stage we found them. As I mentioned previously, we didn't want to be particularly dogmatic about that. We see a lot of friends in the industry that do exclusively company formation. We see other friends in the industry that only invest in existing companies. And we, you know, I guess similar to our philosophy in general, didn't think we needed to do either of those things. We could probably do both. And, but practically speaking, one is a lot easier to do than the other. Investing in a company that already exists with an existing syndicate, with an existing management team, with existing leadership is a lot easier in some sense than um, starting a new company from scratch with no team, no leadership, you know, no board structure, no financial backing. So earlier in Catalio and still as a substantial fraction of our time today, we invest in rounds of financing where, you know, there's already a lead investor, where sometimes it's a series A, but there's already been a seed round. Sometimes it's a series C or a crossover round where there's already been multiple private rounds where we can do our diligence, build conviction in the opportunity, but, you know, have not done the work from day one to stand that company up and get it where it is today. That's very exciting because we've been able to generate a large number of exits from the portfolio of later stage investments that we have. Even in the first you know, 18 months, I think we have eight exits from our portfolio of 35 or so um, companies. And so that's been very exciting and very rewarding and lucrative for our investors. On the other hand, 
we have this fantastic group of venture partners that I mentioned, and that really form the crux of Catalio. And they're coming to us every day with new company ideas and new innovations out of their lab. And so we've been able to start up a number of really exciting new businesses on the basis of those innovations and those discoveries in the lab, but at a, at a relatively slower pace, at a pace of maybe one every six months, maybe one every you know three months in some, uh, some instances. What we'd like to do as we go forward is continue to see that balance shift a little to the left where we begin to amass the resources in-house to launch more new companies with our venture partners, to be able to staff those companies with in-house resources and to be able to incubate and grow those businesses, you know, at Catalio uh, as without, before we go out and bring them to the, to the world at, at large more broadly. So, you know, we've done that successfully to date with now, I think we've done that six times between uh, Camden and Catalio, three times in the last 18 months. And we continue to do it all day, every day, look for opportunities to, be, to grow and, and create new businesses with our venture partners. But that's probably one of the largest growth areas for the firm is bringing in operational talent, folks into Catalio that have run businesses, that have grown businesses, that have led businesses through multiple stages and uh, have them step into the companies that we create with our venture partners to make that startup phase a little bit smoother and a little bit easier. So diving into it, here at Alix, we believe that the key to changing the world starts first with identifying the right problems to solve. When exploring investment opportunities or venture creation opportunities at Catalio, what has been your selection criteria? Yeah, so we really focus at Catalio on best in class science and we really are looking for meaningful innovations. We typically like to see first in class solutions, best in class solutions. We are less excited about fast followers, although you know there's obviously a, a time and a place for those as well. We strongly believe in building companies with platform technologies where we can take multiple shots on goal and ideally leverage a sort of core insight to deliver multiple different opportunities to deliver value. You know, in terms of the areas in which we invest, we're, we're pretty broad. We invest in drugs, devices, diagnostics, discovery programs, data, we invest in tools. We invest in a, a broad spectrum of, I'll say, deep tech life science. But within each of those areas, again, we try to focus on areas of, of significant innovation where we can really capitalize on the expertise that we have in-house in our venture partners. You know, in many cases, the people on our team, the people in our general partnership are the scientists who invented these fields, you know, whether it be, you know, synthetic biology or immuno oncology or anything in between, we have not only the world's leading experts, but, but really the, the forefathers and foremothers of these technical fields. And so we really want to leverage their track record of innovation in those spaces to identify the next big thing in each of those areas. And your portfolio today includes some of the greatest moonshots in biotech, as well as a large number of platform companies. So it really seems you're doing just that. How do you define platform companies? And do you believe they've led to a shift in the investment landscape? What has been your philosophy for backing moonshots? Yeah, you know, I think from a platform, answering the first part of your question first, when we look for platform companies, mostly what we're looking for is a set of related technologies that we can package together in a synergistic way that allow us to have multiple opportunities to, to leverage the work that's being done at the company and, and generate a good outcome, even if one of the individual programs doesn't proceed. You know, what we started with talking about it earlier in the hour was that, you know, it's impossible to predict the future but some people can be right more than others and, and have better guesses than others. And so, you know, in a platform company, what we really have the opportunity to do is take multiple shots, hopefully 
have synergies that we build inside the company where we can move forward multiple assets through the same team with a similar focus in a similar set of markets. And it's almost more of a, a hedge than anything else because while we're investing all this time and energy into this uh, company, we can't always know the outcome of these clinical trials. We'll never be able to have perfect predictability on the science. And so the best thing that we can do is in our mind, build a company that has a bunch of related assets where at least one or two of them will be successful, even if the full set of them is not. That's what we typically mean when we invest in a platform company that we're not putting all of our eggs in one basket. That's obviously different than uh, a portfolio company, sort of like a, you know, a bridge bio is maybe one of the traditional examples of that, where they're pulling together a bunch of disparate assets under the same corporate umbrella. We do a little bit of that too. We have a, a company called Atai Life Sciences, which is probably the, the premier psychedelics therapeutics company in the world that has a collection of assets under one corporate umbrella. But by and large, when we say platform, we usually mean a set of related assets in one company, as opposed to a bunch of companies under the same, under the same corporate structure. To answer the second part of your question on moonshots, you know, the, the team that we've assembled at Catalio, the venture partners, I think are probably better positioned to take moonshots than more or less anybody else in the world, given their scientific expertise. With that said, a lot of moonshots are better funded by organizations like IARPA or DARPA or some of the government organizations than they are in a venture firm. I would say when we get involved in moonshots, you know, by the time we're involved, it's it is still a hugely ambitious project, but there's a line of sight to completion. So if we take Thrive, for example, which is a company started out of Hopkins, actually in my father's group that was uh, recently sold to Exact Sciences for $2.1 billion, Thrive had a hugely ambitious vision to develop a blood-based test for detecting cancer in healthy in otherwise previously thought to be healthy individuals. So looking for screening, develop a screening protocol for, for otherwise healthy individuals to detect cancer earlier than they could through symptomatic means. And, um, you know, as a moonshot, that's probably as big as it gets. It applies to literally the entire healthy population of the planet, trying to build something that someone would get a test that they would take at their doctor's office every year for their entire life and would have the potential of eliminating more cancers more effectively than any other therapeutic intervention. There is no equivalent therapeutic intervention that is as successful at eliminating cancer than earlier detection. So I think that's as big as it gets from a moonshot perspective. However, at the time we invested, this was very mature technology. It had been matured in the lab. And the question was, how to build a business out of it, not whether we can do the science of finding, you know, a needle in the haystack, you know, circulating tumor DNA, for example, in a blood sample. So, you know, we think about moonshots very, very, from both an intellectual perspective and a financial and business perspective, and want to make sure that we're not just throwing money at things because they're interesting ideas, but because there's a line of sight to commercialization and to realization. Thanks for tuning in BIOS community, sharing a quick shout out from Amazon Web Services. The AWS Startups team provides dedicated resources, expertise, and credits to help healthcare and life sciences startups grow and excel. We help startups build for scale, overcome technical and regulatory challenges, and accelerate time to market by opening doors and creating business opportunities. To learn more about these resources, including how to access $25,000 in AWS credits through our partnership with BIOS, please contact Contact us at bios.community backslash AWS. Sure. Given Catalio comes from the Greek to catalyze, what have you seen as Catalio's role in nurturing nascent fields? That's a great question. We very intentionally called the firm Catalio because, as you said, we really hope to catalyze the interactions and the reactions between science and investment and, and generate great outcomes from the combination of those two things. In terms of creating new fields, we certainly feel like we have the, the technical expertise, the network and the financial resources now to, in, to make strategic investments in areas that represent the frontier of life sciences. Some of that 
you know, is in already manifests in our existing uh, portfolio. You can see, for example, in our investments in cancer detection, early cancer detection, we have three different assets in, or four assets now in liquid biopsy, in Thrive, Freenome, PGDX, and Haystack. You can see that in our investments in, in, in some of the upcoming investments that we will be making in uh, synthetic biology, where we think there's a huge opportunity. You can see that in some of our investments in next generation immunotherapy in groups like in Manatee, in a company called Feast, in Immuni. And so, you know, we, we think that with the resources we have, with the team that we have, we can start placing those bets and make sure that the companies that we really have conviction in, the companies that our venture partners have conviction in is representing the, the actual frontier of life sciences in their area of expertise are appropriately capitalized, have the right teams, have the right leadership, have the right vision, have the right financial backing to define the industry over the next decade and to develop and deliver therapies to patients worldwide. Shifting gears slightly to Catalio's team and more specifically, the network of incredible venture partners you've brought together. Your network consists of at least 36 of some of the biggest names in biotech. How do you bring together a nexus of so many incredible inter innovators? Yeah, you know, it turns out that people generally, <laughs> the scientists really want to see good outcomes from their work. I mean, what we have found is the people that we partner with got into science because they wanted to make a difference. And I think many of them have had experiences where they don't see the best science leading to the best companies. You know, they see really good outcomes for companies from a financial perspective, but not necessarily good outcomes from patients and from um, society's perspective. And so, you know, we presented to each of these scientists a different approach, you know, an approach where they were not counterparties in a business transaction for any given deal that we wanted to do where we were trying to license in their IP, but instead where they were partners with us from the beginning in building a new landscape for life science investing and in building a new strategy for life science investing in making science, you know, first and foremost in our investment criteria and in ensuring in those, as I said earlier, that we do have alignment for all stakeholders, you know, for, for investors, for patients and for scientists. And I think, you know, Although they were skeptical, some of them were more skeptical at the beginning, and they've seen through the actions and the way that we compose ourselves and the way that we uh, interact with them and their colleagues that we that we do what we say, you know, that we act with integrity, that we mean um, the things that we write on our slides, and that more more importantly, we take actions to make the world look the way that we think it should, and that we promote the kinds of ideas and the kind of science and the kind of priorities that that they share. And that's really powerful. I mean, we have, obviously we've offered each of these individuals have equity in Catalio. They all have an economic stake, but we get asked all the time, you know, what are the relative, you know, value of those economic stakes to these individuals who are our partners versus the conceptual alignment. And I think it's, it's incomparable. You know, I, I think the economic stake is certainly important and valuable, but more important is having shared principles, shared ethics, shared morals, shared values, and a shared vision for how we want to see life science investing operate. And I think collectively, these 36 partners, you know, all believe in the vision that we've laid out that, you know, it is possible to make the biggest successes, the companies with the biggest impact in scientific and clinical medicine. And, you know, they see us as having the resources and the strategy and the execution required to do it. What are your recommendations for firms seeking to bridge gaps and create a strong innovation and advisory community? You know, I think it all comes down to people and relationships. Generally speaking, when we get asked, you know, questions about the similar question you asked, how do we get people involved? How do we get them engaged? What's the nature of the relationship? I think a lot of people default to assuming 
something about a contract, something about an agreement, something about a, you know, a piece of paper that lawyers, you know, printed things on. And it really has very little to do with that. I mean, that's the, the last kind of dotting your I's and crossing your T's that you need to be a responsible steward of investor capital. But everything that's important happens before that in forming the relationship in building those bridges and in making those connections. So what I would say is find the people that you believe are going to be valuable affecting your vision, bring them in, treat them as partners, you know, make sure that you, they know that you care about them, make sure that they know that you're putting their needs uh, first, that you're demonstrating your value to them and showing them that they are valuable to you and that you're able to operate in a, in a way that's with that that has integrity you know that the actions that you take align with the words that you say and you know like any other relationship when you build that foundation that's very powerful you know that transcends good times and bad times whether it's you know with friends or life partners or with business partners and there's really nothing different uh, about it in, in in our business either the people that we work with are people that trust us and we trust them because we've established that relationship. And it's been, you know, in many cases, sometimes it's over many years, sometimes it moves more quickly because of, you know, an immediate connection. But in all cases, it's, it's based on a foundation of trust and respect and uh, a mutual trust and respect. Jacob, thanks once again for joining us here. A few rapid fire questions to cap things off before we come to a close. Uh -huh. We love to understand from our guests, as we've talked about the, the future ahead, what would you consider the grand challenges facing us in life sciences over the next 30 years? The grand challenges in life sciences over the next 30 years. So I'm going to reel my bias here because I was trained and did my, most of my academic work in neuroscience. I think probably the biggest uncharted frontier in science, both in science and clinical medicine, is the brain. We know embarrassingly little about how our thoughts come together, the, how the words that I'm saying are formulated in my mind, not to mention the various ways in which those neural circuits can be disrupted or interrupted to result in various different maladies and, and affects uh, and clinical uh, conditions. I think we're just now beginning to amass the tools and the tooling that's required to observe the brain and interact with the brain at the size and scale necessary to make meaningful advances in understanding cognition and cognitive dysfunction. We have some bets in that area. In, in Catalio, we invested in a company called Mindex a number of years ago, which was looking to develop non-invasive uh, brain interfaces. And uh, more recently in a company called BlackRock Neurotech that has developed implantable brain interfaces. I think those are two small pieces of the puzzle. And over the next 30 years, those pieces and many others will come together to reveal a lot more about how the, that organ in our minds uh, and our heads work. So I think that's probably the biggest frontier over the next three decades. If I had to pick a single area of innovation would be neuroscience, science of cognition and cognitive dysfunction. Now that we've identified the, the problems facing us, let's maybe flash forward to 2050 and the realization of that vision. Can you describe biotech in 2050? Where will we be? I think we're about in the next in 2050, if we continue on the trajectory we're on, the idea of treating neurocognitive disorders with you know, the kind of broad brushstrokes that we have now where we take a monoamine inhibitor or something uh, that affects all areas of the brain to treat a particular dysfunction will get a lot more customized, a lot more personalized, a lot more directed. So I think we'll have personalized neurotherapy. I think we'll have directed and focused neurotherapies. I think we'll start to attack individual circuit circuitopathies, you know, affecting and intersecting with specific neural circuits as opposed to more broadly interfering with neural signaling throughout the brain. And I think we'll have a lot more customized therapies. I don't think it'll be a kind of one size fits all uh, sort of trial and error treatment mechanism like we have for many neurocognitive disorders now, whether it's, you know, anything from migraine all the way up to depression. I think instead we'll be able to identify and diagnose individuals in 
many different more stratified ways and target therapies and interventions much more effectively for individual people once we understand the specific circuits involved and better understand the ways in which these disorders uh, manifest and, uh, and segment across the population. It's been a great conversation today, Jacob, a lot of fun topics and portfolio companies you've touched on. How can our audience learn more about your work? Any closing thoughts you'd like to share with us? Yeah, well, we definitely maintain our website at cataliocapital.com and our Twitter feed, uh, as well as our LinkedIn posts. And we're trying to be pretty proactive about getting uh, news out there about our companies and about our venture partners and about the things that we're excited about. I think more broadly, we are growing quickly and that means we're always looking to bring new talent to our firm. So at people at all stages of their careers that want to get involved in investing, investing and want to be a part of an organization that invests in best in class science, we welcome strategic hires. We have a number of different roles that need to be filled and we're always looking to bring good people on. We have a very robust uh, internship program as well. So depending on you know, what level of training you have and professional experience you have. We hire a lot of PhDs, MDs, postdocs, people in school or finishing school that are looking to transition from academia to investing and have a pretty robust program there that will help both to give people the right exposure to the investing uh, world, that at least the world that we live in, and also an opportunity to matriculate from that role as an intern to a member of our uh, full-time team. So I would encourage anyone who's listening to this that's excited about what we do, passionate about science, passionate about entrepreneurship, passionate about investing, to reach out and uh, contact us at Catalio, and all of the contact information is on our website. Thank you again, Jacob, for an absolutely fantastic episode. We're very grateful for your time. Appreciate you joining us once more. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in BIOS Community, sharing a quick shout out from Amazon Web Services. The AWS Startups team provides dedicated resources, expertise, and credits to help healthcare and life sciences startups grow and excel. We help startups build for scale, overcome technical and regulatory challenges, and accelerate time to market by opening doors and creating business opportunities. To learn more about these resources, including how to access $25,000 in AWS credits through our partnership with BIOS, please contact us at bios.community backslash AWS. Thank you for listening to the BIOS podcast. If you enjoyed it, please leave a review on your favorite podcasting platform. For more content, please visit bios.community or alix.vc.